Hey, everybody. This is Mario Dennis, your host for the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today I have my good friend, George Philbeck, in the podcast. George, how are you doing, buddy? I'm great, Mario. How are you, man? Thanks for having me. Good, of course. Um, you're one of the people that I really enjoy talking to because you have a very different background than most people. Um, you've been in real estate for a long time. You've done the REO stuff. Um, at a really high level, um, you've done residential stuff, you've done luxury stuff. So it's, you're probably one of the most well-rounded agents, I would say, in Central Florida. Um, because I eat enough food to be really well-rounded, I think. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Um, tell us a little bit about your story for someone that's listening to this that may not be as familiar as I am. Well, I got in real estate, uh, God, it's 2003. I was working for, I was in the restaurant business my whole life and was working for a guy uh, my director report, he was the vice president and I was a general manager and he decided hitting on 18 year old cocktail servers was the right thing to do. And I said, you son of a bitch, I can't work with and uh, quit. My wife said, get into real estate. And I loved it. Um, I spent the first five years calling for sale by owners exclusively. That's all I did. And uh, it worked out really, really well. I was real excited about it. Then got into some marketing, had some money to do some marketing. So went into TV and employed uh, two really, really good mentors what to do and how to do it. And that just blew up. We were selling 150 homes. And then Fannie Mae and I got involved and we were real successful with them through the recession, which was awful. I'm really glad that's over. I don't ever want that job again. And now into traditional real estate for the last three or four years. And it's been phenomenal. It's back to taking care of friends and family and people that you love working with. And that's the really, that's the joyous part. My job with Fannie Mae was because we had, we sell a hundred homes a year or a thousand homes a year. And the worst job there was, you know, that knocking on the door saying, hi, you have to leave. And I couldn't have my staff really do a lot of that. I did a lot of it myself and it just sucks the life out of you. It's just horrible. And this, this is more fun. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people that have been on in the industry for, you know, that predate the recession have a lot of times sort of a similar story in that, um, the job stopped being fun during that time because, oh, yeah. There was a lot of tears. There was a lot of hardship. And, and in your case, just so that the audience can get a real good grasp of it, you were the Fannie Mae agent for Central Florida, for a big portion of Central Florida. Yep. So, you know, when people couldn't make their mortgage payments and those homes were being repossessed by the bank, you were the guy that was basically turning them and reselling them. That's correct. It's a really bad job to have. Yeah. It, I mean, it worked for you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we had, we had 25 people that worked for us, uh, that worked for me. And of those 25, I think we had four kids, uh, four grandkids, um, one divorce, unfortunately, and a couple of marriages in there, excuse me, not grandkids, four marriages, four kids. Uh, so it was really neat because 25 of us came through this and our goal was really to be as supportive as we could through the process. Uh, it wasn't just a numbers game. It was people that we're dealing with, but that takes extra toll on, on you personally when you're doing that. Cause you got to remember everybody has a story. And more than anything, they just want somebody to listen to it. So I, I can't tell you how many times I'd sit at the door. We'd spend an hour or two talking about what they're going through and their problems they had. It doesn't change the outcome, unfortunately. But they just they needed somebody to be aware that this that they got hurt. Now, that being said, there's a lot of investors who made some really stupid investments in 2005 and six, And those homes weren't a problem to take. It's just the tenants that really got hurt on that. It was just a bad situation all around. Yeah, and it was a job that someone had to do. And at the time... I always say like one of the biggest difference, because a lot of people like to make some sort of a parallel between the way an I buyer operates and the way REOs are. And what I always say is the REOs never asked for it. Like the banks never really asked to own thousands of homes. That was a situation that they found themselves in. You would think that they would have some kind of way to forecast this, but it almost seemed like they they landed on that situation and they were like, oh, fuck, what do we do now? Well, watch the big uh, the big short. I mean, it really explains right. it. I watched it. I was right in the middle of this whole damn thing. I'm watching the big short. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? This is what just happened. And it, it, you're, you're right. It's a lot different than the I, I buyer program right now. I mean, I, I've literally, you want to talk about that? We really probably should. I've sold yeah. a home to OfferPad, Open Door, and uh, Zillow Offers. I gave all three of them one of my investment properties and kind of ran through and what they do over the last couple of years. So I, I'm fairly comfortable with their dynamic, how they work, what their margins are, what they're looking for. And honestly, when all of it comes down to it, for anybody that's listening, buyers, sellers, doesn't matter, agents, tell your people, everybody's out there to make money and they're making money on the sellers of the properties. It's not the right way to go. Yeah, and you know, shifting gears into that a little bit, 
I had Sean Frank from Mainframe on the podcast last week. Great guy. And Sean Frank had a line that resonated with me. Like it literally gave me goosebumps because I've been, I've been a staunch advocate about educating consumers about what an iBuyer okay. is because if you let them do the educating, it's probably going to be highly skewed. You so, um, so I think as real estate agents, we have a responsibility to provide the tools and the resources to give to sellers so that sellers really know what they're getting themselves into. And what Sean Frank said was, I buyers are trying to take, and Wall Street are trying to take the American dream away from people. And that, r- that, that really resonated with me because it, it's true. I mean, like, Wall Street really figured out a way to invest by no assuming risk, meaning the biggest risk of owning real estate is that the holding portion. When you buy a home, anyone that's ever bought a home, the time you hold it is truly the risk. The risk is in, you know, hoping that the market goes the right way, but no one has a crystal ball. But if you come after the market has appreciated and you try to take a portion of that appreciation, which is what I buyers are doing, that's basically coming in after the fact and saying, thank you, seller, for assuming the risk. We'll go ahead and take our, you know, 7% and and let you go on the way. Like, it's just crazy. Well, they, they charge, <clears throat> besides the fees are, are pretty darn steep on that one. They're they're looking to make money. They have to. That's their job. They're in business. And you're absolutely right. They're taking it away. And, and the... The, the, the carrot for the for the sellers in there is, oh, well, you don't have any showings and you don't have to worry about it. I don't know about most of y'all, but if you price it fairly well, you and I both know this in pretty much any market, if you price it well, you're going to get the results you need. It doesn't need a lot of showings. It just needs to be priced right. And price right is usually 10% higher than anything you're going to get from an iBuyer. Yeah. And so the, the thing that they sell, right, what you're saying, that convenience factor, that always gets to me because they're selling you a product, but they're not telling you the price on it. Meaning if I have buyers, if you could go to whatever one of their websites and it said, Hey, sell your home to us. We charge a 5% fee and you know, blah, blah, blah. And we'll send you an offer. I would be even 10 times more comfortable than I am with it now. But I think the fact that if I send an offer request to an I buyer from my house and my neighbor sends one from his house, the likelihood is, that we're going to have different convenience fees for each one of our homes, Probably. even though we're in the same neighborhood, even though it's all the same thing. So like the convenience fee, you're not really paying for convenience. They're doing a mathematical calculation. That's a seesaw between what they feel you're going to take on the offer side and what, you know, how they feel they can make money on the fee side. Um, so it's, it's almost dishonest in that way that you're saying to people, Hey, it's convenient to sell a home to us, but they're not telling you up front, Like, it's like, it's like we're sell, we'll buy your home and we're going to give you this convenience thing. But first, give me your name, your address, how much you own your mortgage, all, you know, pictures of your house. And then after you give me all of that, George, and you're really invested into this process, then I'll, dis- I'll disclose the price. But wait, it gets better. So they'll give you a price. And if you're comfortable, you say, you know what, I'm going to do it because it's convenient. They don't tell you about the part where they come in afterwards and then they go apart your home and they tear it apart and anything that needs to be done, they're going to charge you for. So you're basically guys hear this. This is real important. Whatever you sell the home for, you're then going to pay them to make it in the top position it possibly can. New paint, new carpet, new roof, or at least a credit for it. Plumbing, if it needs PVC piping, and you'll pay full on tilt for it. So you're paying them to condition it to be the top home in the market and you're selling it to them for less, plus the expense you have to pay on top of it. It just doesn't make financial sense. Yeah, and I think I, I think there's a much better product than that agents need to be you know, talking about with their sellers because a lot of times the sellers are thinking, a lot, I've run into this a few times this year where someone has an investment property and they don't have five grand to drop into it to make it you know, optimum condition. So mm-hmm. they request the iBuyer offer and thankfully, in this case, they got to me before they signed anything. And I go to them, I'm like, listen, give me the listing. I'll handle the carpet. I'll pay out of my pocket to do new carpet paint and get your home in optimum condition. I get the listing and I'm going to make my money on the listing side. And I allow that seller to get maximum return for their investment because now the house looks much better. Like a lot of real estate agents would be willing to do that. So if you're a seller, so. yeah, a lot of <laughs> sellers like, don't don't just think that you're you know the the a real estate agent just comes and puts a sign and says all right let me know when the house is ready like you know we can do a lot more for a seller than just that well and i think we have to at this point we're getting to the point in the market uh, and, and the market will change so this this will 
the whole dynamic of what we're doing will change as the market shifts because it's going to shift. It always does. But you're right. We're, we're able to do much more than just the sign in the yard. That's not what selling a home is about. It's about a level of service and commitment. And there's a lot of agents that will do it. I know you will. You and I have talked about this before. We're doing this right now. Uh, of course, Jackie and I will. And, and there's so many more. Sean Frank, who was on last time. That's just, that's just the level of service we provide our clients. I just... Uh, I got to keep going back to this iBuyer program because it's something that's important. The average, uh, I'm guessing on this, but let's say the average home has 80% loan value in there, say 20% equity. If you're going to lose 5% to the iBuyer program because that's what they're going to charge, either a depreciation or extra, excuse me, not depreciation, a low ball offer to you, or they're going to charge you a, a, a convenience fee, that's 25% of your entire equity position. It just doesn't make sense to do that. It really doesn't. I mean, otherwise, why would you invest in a property? Just keep renting it. We're buying it to keep the money. It's not a big deal to show it three times and show it professionally. I'm so glad that you're bringing that up. I'm so glad because the conversation rarely, rarely takes place in those terms. Stop thinking about percentage based on the value of the house. No, that's what you have. Start thinking on percentage of the equity that you're walking away from the house. Mm -hmm. If, if an agent that say the cost is 6% and with this guys after repairs and everything is costing you 9%, it's not, oh, it's a 3% different. No, 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 no. You got to look at what that represents of your equity. And likely, like you said, if you have $50,000 of equity and it's costing you another 10 grand, that's 20% of equity that you're giving away. The bottom line is this. I don't know about you. You probably have richer friends than I do. But I don't know many people that have... $20,000 sitting on the bank right now. And if they do, it took them a lot of sacrifice to save it up. So to give it away to Wall Street, it seems just completely asinine. Well, and it's not just Wall Street. I mean, you've got to consider that there are, there are leaders of these companies and their whole purpose is to retire a billionaire. And they're going to do it on the back of people that work very hard to pay their house, keep it up, keep it in good condition. And they're going to take it from advantage of them in a position when they're ready to sell because they have to go. I get that. I understand the dynamic of it, but the illusion of it being so much easy is it so much easy worth 25 or 50% of your hard work for the last couple of years. It just doesn't make sense. No. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. Right. And I think at one point in the podcast, I kind of talked about that with someone else that I, everyone loves convenience. That's an absolute truth. It's like saying everybody likes honest people. No one likes a liar. Right. So right. If you say, would you like more convenience, George? The answer 100% of the time will be yes. yes. The question then becomes, how much are you willing to pay for convenience? So I always give the example of an oil change on my truck. If, if Ford you know, charged me $20 to come pick it up at home and drop it off, I would pay the $20. If they charge me $1,000, then that convenience is no longer worth $1,000. You know? Convenience is something that we all desire. So telling people that things are going to be more convenient is all fine so long as you pair it with a price so that they can assess whether that convenience is worth what you're charging them. And oftentimes, you know, so the problem with the agents, and I see this a lot in the national groups, pe people that don't live in areas that are, you know, invaded by iBuyers right now. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of states, a lot of cities that don't, don't have iBuyers right now, they're like, well, I mean, if you present your case to the seller, you'll win every time. Yeah, but the problem is, you don't always get to present your case to the seller. Right. A lot of times the seller, for whatever reason, it might be an embarrassing situation, it might be a divorce situation, it might be whatever the case might be, they just don't talk to any experts about it. Well, the funny thing is there's a lot of brokerages out there that are now switching their mentalities on this and they're participating in the iBuyer program, which is neat because it's a different participation than we just want to make money off the sellers. It's we want to make sure we handle the listings. Obviously, that's what a real estate agent does. But we don't want to make money our agents will make money and then the company makes money. It's a different philosophy to it. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly though, but the, the, it's just, they're out to take whatever they can. And the, the carrot is the, the comfort as you spoke of. And that carrot, unfortunately comes with a hefty price tag. And what they don't do is what you and I do all the time. Disclose, disclose, disclose. There isn't any, and I don't know why it's not governed. It's not my place to say it should be, but for me, I want to know, what are your fees up front before I send an offer? Just be disclosing on what's Before happening. I give you all my data, Absolutely. which is what you're after anyways. Well, that's it. It's all data mining anyway at this point. You know, it, it's what you're after anyways. If It's a great success if you can take the data of a thousand people and even only one person takes the offer. I mean, the, the idea is that you got the data of all those other people that they're selling to 
whether it's other agents or other brokerages or other services that then are going to market the hell out of those people because they know they have an, um, a, a little desire to sell somewhere in their mind. So, you know, uh, oftentimes that's, that's probably the thing that people are most naive to is the fact that their data is oftentimes the precious commodity. And right now it's not treated as such. Like right now, they don't treat people's information as a commodity, but I, I, I presume we will eventually. Like I presume these companies at some point or another are going to have to like either send you a $5 Amazon gift card for taking your data or have to throw it away or something along those lines. Because well, Facebook just got tightened up on their data and whether they're able to, where they're data mining. Well, that's not fair. It's not where they're data mining, it's where they're data using and that they're re reselling that data. They can't resell it the same way. And it's going to happen with everybody at some point because, I mean, nothing's transparent or nothing's hidden anymore. Everything we do, I mean, my wife is like, I know exactly where you are. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, to the point of the Facebook thing, I one of my fears or one, I shouldn't say a fear, I don't lose sleep over this stuff, but one of the things that I think about sometimes is what happens when when something grows and government, you know, gets spooked by it which is the case i think with social media like you know if we i'm not getting into politics in this show but if both the right and the left believe that social media skews the other way like the right things they're too left friendly and the left things they're not hard enough to the right and so um that's just one of the things that's taking place right now what happens is then government comes with a heavy hand of regulation and they take a machete to something that should be a scalpel and they totally um, like flip the script on the game. And I think that's yep. probably what's going to happen uh, with a lot of the tech companies, which the Department of Justice just two weeks ago up in what they called a broad inquiry into tech companies. And that they didn't mention specific tech companies. They called it a broad inquiry to figure out whether tech giant tech companies are responding to the consumer's needs or whether giant tech companies are blocking avenues that would normally be where consumers would want to go to funnel them in a specific direction and they didn't specify google or amazon or facebook right none of those big tech companies well it's all of them (laughs) basically basically it's all of them that's what it comes down to is it's going to be all of them because i i think the inclination from someone looking at it from a regulatory standpoint is you know we got to figure out a what algorithms you guys are using to target people, why people are getting targeted with certain things, um, and figure out whether this is in the consumer's best interest or if at this point, because you guys control all of the avenues of technology online on a very small, you know, like Silicon Valley controls 80% of the traffic of the internet, you know, the small space that controls basically global internet traffic. And so the, the question I think they're trying to ask is whether it, whether those people are responding to a consumer need or whether those people are just forcing consumers into needs that they wouldn't have otherwise. Well, there's a big argument out there, and it, it comes from political position, where that they can literally influence votes. And uh, I, I believe there's probably some truth to that, and that's about as much of politics as I choose to get into. But I think there's that kind of power that's out there. Um, I want to spin back. I, I, I'm not yeah. done with the... Go. With the... Um, with the, the iBuyer program and, and we have all these people that are kind of picking away at what we do as real estate agents. And it's my firm, firm belief, I'm committed to this 100%. And having gone both directions on this from spending money at marketing, I know how it works. Relationships will be marketing every single day. The relationships that we have is our, with our clients is the most important asset that we have. With the average real estate agent, uh, if they've got a pulse and they've got a license that's active, sells six homes a year. And if they're actively selling homes, the average goes up to eight. Truth is, though, if we're focusing on our database, if we're focusing on the people that we're already in relationship with, we're providing them with good information, phenomenal support, and really being a great connector, these iBuyer companies are going to very, very quickly feel or realize that they can't compete with the relationship because all they are is a sales pitch. And that doesn't stand up after a time. That's my opinion. And I'm just, I think that we can put a, an end to this, but we have to do it with everybody getting good at what they do. I agree. And, and that's part of the, the notion that some of this is self-inflicted. Right. Oh, yeah. The opening for these companies to show up, it's not didn't come from their genius. It came from our own sloppiness in the way we conduct business, you know, generally speaking. Gary Keller nailed this 10 years ago, literally 15 years ago. He's like, listen, you guys are opening up Pandora's box with Zillow and Realtor.com. We're literally allowing them to buy or to sell us our leads. 
And uh, well, it's it's gone from them selling us our leads and then making a lot of money on us. And now it's a referral base. And now they're all real estate agents. So they don't actually need our data anymore. They can harvest it themselves because they're all brokers. And we did it. Yeah. And from a personal level, I, you know, I remember hearing that also. And, you know, I, I come from a school of thought that you never bring up a problem unless you have a solution. And so one of the things about that is I don't disagree with the notion that, yes, purchasing leads creates a Pandora's box. But for crying out loud, you people, like the people, the captains of industry, if you will, that, that were controlling the levers, you had an opportunity to put a stop to it. You had an opportunity to say, oh, why is this people, why, how come a com- these companies have oxygen to survive? They have oxygen because real estate agents are operating on 20-year-old technology for the most part across the nation. So if we don't have a state-of-the-art search engine online, someone else came and built a state-of-the-art ser- search engine and took our lunch money. I think that's also self-inflicted in a way. Like, I, I just wish the foresight to say they're going to take our lunch money would have been a company with, they're going to take our lunch money. So what we are doing is I'm sitting down with, you know, Remax CEO and Compass CEO and Rheology CEO, and we are going to come up with a comprehensive search engine that, that protects the listing data to the real estate agents. If that's going to happen, that's great. But the challenge is we've got all these agents out there that are actually making some money doing this. Now they're spending a lot more and making a lot less as they've gone into the, uh, I'm going to draw, I'm going to say this incorrectly. It's all referral based at this point or becoming there because they realize that's the big brokerages, the big companies, the Remax, or excuse me, not uh, Remax, um, Zillow and, and realtor.com realize that's the most amount of money, right? We can't steer everybody. And you have to consider from a broker's position for Compass to say, well, we're no longer going to do this whatsoever. You got, what, 15,000 agents that are with Compass. Half of them are going to be like, well, that's where I make my money. I can't stay here anymore. There's a fear factor involved that has to be a general consensus from everybody. They're eventually going to harm themselves. At least that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I, 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 just w- I just wish that we're, it seems they're all very aware now, of course. Yep. I just wish the same level of heightened awareness would have come earlier on. Um, because I, I, I think it's just late now. Like I, I think, when I think when somebody says we're going to invest all this money on tech, it's like, sounds to me like you're chasing a thoroughbred with a greyhound and it's not going to, it's not going to work because these companies have a 10 year advantage in you on tech, which is a thousand normal years. Well, and I, I know exactly where we're referring to on this one, and, and I, I think they're going to do a phenomenal job with it. But you're right. There's still a startup in this industry, and it's not necessarily required. I mean, I, think of it from this perspective. With you and I, what we do, how much technology do you really use in your day-to-day business? I know I personally, I don't use that much. My day-to-day business is the clients I work with, my people I work with. And while tech may make some of it user-friendly, it's not what's bringing all my business to me. I don't have all these expensive algorithms and, and most regular agents won't. What they use tech for is a convenience factor. Well, it's neat to say and tech's, tech's awesome and it's great to have some support with it. Bottom line is it's all about people. Yeah, the technology is there to facilitate our activities and to make them a little more streamlined. Yep. And and I think I think there has to be a separate conversation be, between technology being um, created and used for the purposes of generating business and technology being used and created for the purposes of making the transaction more user friendly for all the parties involved. Both of, both of what you said though, do not require high level technology, right? It really doesn't. What it requires is a little bit of planning, a little bit of putting it into play. And then it's really a duplicatable force. It's not uh, this incredible, oh my God, we just created Amazon's ability to distribute product across the world. Right. Uh, We're still dealing with a very micro market with people we know, and it's all about relationships. It has to be about relationships and technology is going to support you in that. So all this, well, I've got the best tech and he's got the best tech. Does it really matter? What matters is, do you have the best clients? I think it's just, I I think quite frankly, what it boils down to it, I think it's, I think it's a sales pitch for recruiting. Uh, Absolutely. I think that's what it boils down to because Here's the thing. The holy grail of technology in real estate would be if you could get listings listings to show up on your inbox every day. Like if you had a system that can trap sellers or discover sellers and get their information and their committal, 
and get it delivered to your inbox effortlessly. That's truly the holy grail. But we're not there. I don't know if we'll get there eventually or not, but we're certainly not there. We're not we're not in that neighborhood yet. Not for free. I mean, that's ultimately what the the iBuyers are doing. They're using uh, marketing platforms, a lot of TV at this point. When you all, it, if you have iBuyers or not in your market, you'll see them on TV. They'll be right there. Everybody will know they're coming, and they're using that. But it's a very very expensive algorithm. Still, the best is the people in your neighborhood know who you are and you know who they are, and you help them buy and sell. And you don't need tech for that. I really don't agree with it. Um, it's interesting that we're talking a lot about a technology. You are with EXP, obviously, mm-hmm. which is sort of like um, it became sort of like the um, the tech hand grenade that blew up in the industry a, couple, a few years ago. And it just kind of took over because of a absolutely astonishing growth in terms of agent count. and. But it's not tech based. I mean, it, it, that's not fair. With everything, you know, the best technology companies are really the, the big brokerages. They have the most amount. EXP isn't technology-based. It's level of service-based for the agents. And that's it's it. It's, it's, there's really about four or five things that anybody's going to look in their brokerage for. And, and they're, uh, I'm not going to go into them because this isn't a sales pitch sure. on it. But the bottom line is technology is not the big animal in the room. The big animal in the room is always going to be training, is always going to be support, is always going to be cost. And all of those have to make sense. Nothing's perfect for everybody. Uh, I think it's a great company, though. Um, if you had to, if you had to attribute the growth of EXP, and I think, I think that the thing that's tough with national companies is the thing that, like at Central Florida, is super crowded with real estate brokerages. Right. But, but I don't know if that's the case in the entire country. Um, but, but what whatsoever, what I mean is, if if you had to attribute it to one thing, how this company goes from you know, barely visible to a powerhouse, because it really is. I mean, whether someone likes it or doesn't like it, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The reality is it's a giant force right now, and you can't turn the corner in real estate without seeing EXP somewhere. How how does that happen? Well, I've got to ask you a question, and if you don't mind, I'll I'll give you your answer with a question. When you're talking to your clients and they're interested in making a a long-term decision, do you encourage them to rent their home long term or do you encourage them to buy a home i'll buy so why do you rent your brokerage i own mine and i get compensated as an owner for doing that nobody else does this is the whole thing everybody's there's all these stories out there it's not sustainable that they're they're not positive positive cash there's all that stuff and and research it most of it's baloney i've researched and i've spoken to our president ceo coo uh, just going through all that because you have to but the bottom line the bottom line for you and for me is i own my brokerage I have a piece of it. I'm a shareholder and owner in this thing. And I get rewarded as a broker, as I choose to invo- be involved in that aspect of it, as the, the owner, the, the Gary Kellers, the David Linegers. I get a small piece of that pie. I'm not renting. Are you? Yeah. I mean, in that perspective, um, I, I think what's interesting with, especially a guy like you is, you know, the pre- what someone would have predicted is George Philbeck by now would have George Philbeck real estate opened up. Like, Oh, George doesn't want the headache of that. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not that there, there's a running joke with one of my, uh, I had a, a financial administrator in my brokerage when we were, when we were really blowing up with REOs and we had all those people and she'd bring in a, a, a human resources manual. I'd say, get that out of here. That's do, I, I don't want that legal stuff in there. I don't want the financials. I don't want to have to deal with a CPA. I don't want to have to file multiple tax returns for, the brokerage and all it brings into it. That part I don't want to do. What I want to do is I want to help buyers and sellers buy and sell. And I want to make friends while I'm doing it. And I want to partner with great agents that are like-minded. You can keep the the broker side of it. That's one thing that I really like about you is that one of the things that you always talk about is buyers and sellers. And it's because I think you have this this belief, which I share in, that we're still a transaction-based business. Yeah transactions are not only what keeps the lights on, but is what really gives, that's why we have a job is transactions. And I think sometimes some of the criticism for companies like EXP is, it seems sometimes like a, some agents would lose focus and go more in recruiting than they would on the transactional base. Do you think that's fair? It's, or? it's true. Uh, it, uh, it's absolutely true. There's a, there's a long-term plan involved in this and you can actually build, I've got 250, 40 agents wow. that are in my little real estate business inside of our big real estate company. And uh, while I'm not necessarily involved with every single one of them because they're not all on the same level, these are all people that ultimately I kind of started with this as we're, as we're going through it. 
uh, that's great. So yeah, some of my focus is on there, but the bottom line is the majority of my focus is still on the active real estate because that's what we do long term. Now, three or four years down the road, that may turn into enough where I don't have to sell 30 homes a year to make the same amount of money I want. I only have to sell 15 and I'm, I'm down on that. That'd be cool because I like to sail in the Caribbean a lot. I was going to say that, that we'll see more George Philbick in the British Virgin Islands. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's, it's about, about two years ago when I was looking at this, I looked at this for seven months before I came on board and, and it, I would encourage everybody to take a look at this. I mean, everybody, I, I sure. talked to everybody about it. What's most important to you as a bro, as a, as an individual. And for me, it's my family. So I wanted to put more effort and time back into that. And this gave me a vehicle at which I could do so. Um, I don't think any brokerage is better than any other, quite honestly. I, I love the... the I, I do. There's some that suck. Okay. Let's be... Yeah. <laughs> that's right. This is not CVS or NBC. There are some that are really, really shitty. Uh, and there's some that are phenomenal out there. Um, and, and I just... This, this company fit what I wanted to do, and it fit my long-term plans. I don't plan on ever retiring, but I, I love this story. So I have a friend of mine, a great friend. He wants to sell his house. And he goes, George, I want to sell it. I think it was worth around $350,000. And I said, all right, so tell me what you want to do. He goes, well, I want to make this a lifestyle sale. I said, you have my undivided attention. You just talked to me about this. He goes, I want to get back to the $500,000 sales that we used to have in this neighborhood. I said, I'm going to turn my phone off. I'm 100% committed to you on this. What are we going to do? He goes, it's going to be a lifestyle sale. We can get it up to 500. I said, how are we going to do that? He goes, I'm throwing in a golf cart. So it better be a fucking Bentley golf cart because <laughs> you don't know ever say now those are great people and I'm going to help him yeah. because he's a great friend of mine. I have no challenge doing this, but the bottom line is he's not going to be the most reasonable in this. And I know it's going to be a challenging work while I won't not ever help a friend. That's not my most desirable position. Somebody calls me and they said, listen, I want to sell my house and I want a hundred thousand dollars more. I'd rather refer them out to somebody else. If I have the ability to say my, my, what I need for income is covered. Wouldn't it be nice for me to take a little time for me and my family and put it back there? Because ultimately, that's my big why. And I absolutely love everything that you're saying. Because, you know, obviously, in the, in the joking about there's broker just that suck, um, sometimes I think I get misunderstood because I speak very plain and clearly about these things. But listen, I think more brokerages are better. I love what EXP does. I love what everybody does. Because ultimately, I'm pro-agent. Yeah. So anything that provides additional competition, which means more creative way, ways for agents to keep more of their money, sign me up. I mean, sign me up. I want everybody to open a brokerage. I want everybody to come up with a new crazy idea on how the compensation works. I want to, I, I, I love all of it because I think ultimately benefits the agents, which I think are the people that do the soldiers, you know, they are the ones on the trenches. Yep. They're the ones doing the hard work. It's not the brokers. It's not the big CEOs and it's not, um, you know, the team leads that have 10,000 agents under them or 200 agents under them. It is the agents that are, you know, listening to those objections, trying to figure out how to, you know, convince someone to leave the koi pond in their house that they want to take away. Like those are the people that I advocate for. So, what EXP does, what everybody else does, I love it because it brings more competition to the marketplace. And ultimately, I think that's that's what the industry needs. And you know what the else the industry needs is a guy like you to come and tell people, hey, I've done hundreds of homes a year, and I'm telling you, time with your family. Find something that you enjoy, whether it's sailing yeah. on the Caribbean or whatever the case might be, and figure out a way to do your business so that you can do it with high integrity at a high level so your buyers and sellers are getting top-notch service. And so that you can get back out to do the thing that you love because time is the one commodity we don't get back. So I've got to ask you a question because this is, uh, we kind of put the cart before the horses. We're talking about the brokerage and let's spin it back and talk about the agents because this is where I've, I've sure. Uh, here, here's the thing. Had I known that I loved teaching and, and kind of coaching and mentoring uh, so much, I'm, I'm glad I didn't find that out when I was in high school or I'd be a middle-aged broke high school teacher. Uh, but this is the part that is just the most fun for me. And I want to ask you, just be real transparent. Of the top 100 people, 150 people that you have in your database that you can have influence over or that you're friends with, how many times a month do you talk to them or communicate with them on point and on purpose? If you had to guess, any numbers, fine. Uh, top 100 and 150, I don't, I don't know that many people closely. Um, to top 50, top 100. I, I would say, I think there's probably about 20 people in my life that I will make the effort to talk to multiple times a week, sometimes multiple times a day. I think there is, you know, probably between 25 and 50 
le- a lot less often, maybe once a week. And then, you know, the, the, the rest of the people, I think it's kind of on a come by come basis as needed, if you will. Um, but I'm a terrible friend. So <laughs> I, I just disclosed that because I'm a super high D and I'm an introvert. So I recharge my energy by spending time alone. The joke is that I hang on a closet somewhere in Transylvania, like, because that's how I recharge my energy. It's that closet right there. Yeah. Right so, <laughs> so that's how I recharge my energy. Um, but also social media has made things really weird now because, mm-hmm. because I have three, 4,000 people on my, just my, between my Facebook and my Instagram, there's other 2000 people there. So I feel like I'm connecting with them a lot more often than I am, but I, you know, who knows how effective that is, right? So I've been interviewing a lot of agents over the last uh, year or so. This has really been a primary focus of mine. And I have intentionally ignored my database for 15, 16 years uh, and ignored the buyer side, everything else. It's funny, uh, Jenny and I, Jenny Weimer and I had a, this thing, we, we did some math and we figured that if you ignore buyers 4.5 times, they'd stop calling you. This is back in 2003, four and five. And I've focused a lot of my energy back in the database. And, and when I'm interviewing people and I'm talking to them, most people out there, if they pick their top hundred that have the greatest opportunity for referral business or repeat business, speak to them maybe a half a time a month. And my question always is, if we're looking at how do we solve the problem, taking an agent that sells eight homes and putting them up to 16 or 20 or 30 homes, it's not that challenging to do. What they're missing is a lot of the structure. And I'm, I'm surprised that some of these big brokerages don't have this built in automatically. But if you communicate with your database, three times on purpose per month, never about real estate, really. I mean, one time is a real estate related one, but it's a postcard. It's not a communication, but you're talking to them about them and you're talking about you. What would happen to most people's business? It it would have to double. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things um, going back to social media that it does really well is allows you to do that in a more, in a less invasive, less salesy way. Because um, what I've said, like when people ask me, well, you know, I've been out of the team business now for a couple of years and, um, you know, last year I did well, this year I'm going to do better than I did last year. And, and, you know, how do I measure those incrementals and what do I, I attribute them to is I say to people, I have made it okay for anyone to reach out to me to talk about real estate because it's not longer work for me because I, people understand that I have fun with real estate. I love real estate. I really, really do. It's good that I get paid for it. But if I didn't, I would still be looking at homes. I would still be touring homes. I would still be figuring out comps in neighborhoods and how the values are affected and looking at stats because I enjoy it. And so what's happened is, whereas before I think if someone, you know, most people's database, if someone is thinking, for example, about a beach condo, you know, Mm -hmm. They just had this, they went to the beach, they fell in love and they're like, oh man, I, it would be great to have a beach condo. They will probably research it on their own for a very long time before they reached out to someone if they ever got to that point. Right. With my database, it doesn't work that way. With my database, they go and they're at the beach and they think for one nanosecond about the condo. They're like, fuck it, let's reach out to Mario. See what, he's always talking about houses anyway. So That's the involvement that you have. And unfortunately, that's not relevant or not prevalent in most real estate agents. There's this barrier to do, well, what you're doing right now, this is, this is pretty ballsy to set this up in your house and get this going and to have that kind of following. I'm talking about the average agent out there that's selling six, seven, eight homes a year. They're not really doing what they should be doing that's free for or the most part, that's highly effective and is the number one source of business for most of us and is also... Uh, and this is my personal vendetta at this point, this will put iBuyer programs out of business if we can do it at 100%. a high level. That's, that's all I'm focusing on, not just for my business, but also for teaching other agents how to do it. And we've come up with some really cool stuff. And I'll, I'll share it with you when we're done because this isn't a sales pitch on it, but it's just, it's neat and it's so easy. And I've thought about, I've thought about this before because I, I share in the same belief with you that there is, there is things that can be taught to agents to make them more productive, but it doesn't necessarily get taught with the importance and relevance that I think it should be like the same, like it doesn't have, when I've been in classes in a giant brokerage and they're talking about sphere and database and touching them or whatever, I don't think the proper urgency was given. Now that could simply be the person that was instructed to talk this particular day, having a bad day, or it could just be part of a more systematic concern, which is, a lot of times the best way to retain a bunch of agents that are paying you a gym membership is 
by keeping them busy, going to a thousand classes, about a thousand things, about 998 things that they're never going to use or are not important, two of which will be important. And so I think what happens a lot of time is, like, I agree with you. I think all that should be taught is database management and how to touch the database. And that should be the focus of accountability um, in broker just, but it's not the case. They're, they're learning about stupid shit, like where to place your open house signs. Well, you know, maybe don't talk about that. Like let them figure that one out on their own, but tell them how to use the database. Tell them what's good communication, review their communication with their database and critique it. Say, you know what, came across a little too salesy on this one. Okay, you talk to this person today. Well, don't talk to the sister tomorrow. You know, like... Common sense. More common sense yep. stuff, but that that I think would be much more... Um, well, it, and also, we've seen this many, many times. Where we're teaching people. We're trying to help them do it. You can lead a horse to water, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to drink. I believe very, very strongly that it needs to be something that's pretty simple, that's very duplicatable, that doesn't require a lot of effort and time. And more than anything, what's most successful about this is reminders that you've got something coming up in a couple of days, like a, a video email or send out a postcard to your database that, that, so that you're not just thrown into it because you and I both know the normal reaction is, oh, I got to do this. It showed up on my... My technology, this is really where technology comes in. It says, I have to do this now. I can't do it today. So it just gets lost and there's no consistency. And that's the killer for most agents. Right. Because when you snooze it away or you throw it away, yep. it doesn't give you a shock in the back of your neck. It just, it's just, it's gone. And, and that, oh, I'll get to it next month. And all of a sudden next month turns into the following month. And for anybody watching, if you're going to go into farming and farming is a great way to build a business. It's all about consistency. And if you forget that consistency, you're, you're, you're wasting most of your money. Same thing goes with database management. It's not about saying, hey, refer people to me. It's about connecting with them and having conversations about what they're doing and, and them being able to connect with what you're doing. Um, when you're talking about consistency, um, is this kind of part of where your schedule comes in? Do you have a pretty structured schedule with this stuff uh, and your database? Or For my database, I absolutely do. Yeah. Uh, and if, for me to manage a database, we've got 80 people that are in there at this point. We started with 68. We've added, we continue to add to it. As I said, I, you know, selling a thousand homes a year, I ignored my database. Stupid move on George's part. Um, and, and it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes a day at the most and 30 minutes over the course of the month. And I'm seeing amazing results. I'd really just kind of put all this into play a couple months ago and it's crazy. The first month I did, I've got six people that call me. One was a past client. We're engaged in conversation with 20 or 30 people from there. One was a past client. He goes, George, I need you to come sell my house. I say, oh, I remember exactly where it is. He goes, no, no, no. I bought a new one with another agent. Well, you know, and I have to push back on one thing. You say you sold a thou thousands of homes and that was a stupid move to not take care of the database. Yep. Had you taken care of the database, you wouldn't have sailed as much in the Caribbean. So <laughs> don't beat yourself up over that. No, I'm dead serious about it. I'm dead serious. Right. Things don't live in a vacuum. You don't let, you don't get to have both. Yeah. Part of the reason you've been able to sell in the Caribbean is because you didn't do that thing. And so, you know, part of the, you know, one of the biggest things that I think real estate agents need to understand is a, there's limited time. So, you know, you have to really figure out what it is that you want to do and figure out your big why, because otherwise you're chasing. It's the whole lie about work life balance. And the lie is that the wor more you work, the less of a quality of life that you have and the other way around. Well, real estate agents kind of think that they're going to get to a point in their career where things are just magically going to fizzle away and they you know, the stress is going to fall off their back and then they get to go sail. No, you have that, to go sail today and then figure out tomorrow how to do tomorrow. So you're, what you're saying is exact. I hope everybody hears this really clearly, you as well and me, and I just got to remind myself, Jackie's and our goal is we want a vacation one week out of the month. Now, that doesn't mean we're not working in that week, but we can do it anywhere. And the only challenge that we really run into is if we're working with a buyer, we need to show it. But we have enough partners. And remember when I said those 200 agents or so, those are, those are our business partners. I'll show properties for them if they're away. They show them for me. And it gives us the ability to go to Italy or go to the Virgin Islands or go somewhere and do what we really love to do while we're doing what we really love to do, which is sell homes. And, and they're not inclusive or exclusive of each other. You can do both at the same time. And you just got to plan it. You say, what do I want? If you want to sell 30 or 35 homes, that's what, $300,000 in our market, which is great. Uh, I don't poo-poo that. That's phenomenal. You can do that and still take a week off almost every month and have an extraordinary experience with your your children, your wife, your, your family, your friends. That takes, what that takes is 
a heightened situational awareness for people. And I don't think, A, I've never heard it talked about in any kind of group setting in a brokerage. And it's a very difficult thing for someone to come to terms with on their own is coming to that realization or that awareness that, um, that, that you are able to sometimes do things simultaneously. But most importantly, you have to pick your big why. And your big why is still going to be quality of life. Like, I know it. Mm-hmm. I know it. If I told you tomorrow, George, there is this company coming in town and they want to list, you know, 50 homes. But the one requirement that they have is you have to sign a contract for 24 months. You are not going anywhere. You wouldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You yeah. wouldn't do it. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not for sale. I can be leased for a while, but I'm not for sale. I use that as a joke all the time. But the, you're, you're absolutely right. You, you've got to make a conscious choice of where you want to be. All the agents that are, are watching this, anybody that's listening, and I'll, and I'll never change my opinion on this one. Uh, I'm the same as every other agent. I started literally when I went to EXP, I walked away from six or seven transactions a month from the REO business, and I was like everybody else. I didn't have a billion dollars stored up. I didn't have a database that was functioning. I had to rebuild this. And if you put your mind to it, in two years, you can accomplish so much. And, and people are really, really short-sighted. And I would challenge everybody not to be. What do you want your dream to be and work towards it? Remember, it's not going to happen overnight, but in two years, it can happen instantly. And you've become, uh, and I mean this in a complimentary way, like you've become sort of an expert at rebuilding your business just because the business that you once were in, which was sort of the for sale by owner or whatever, that got, got taken over mm-hmm. by the REO business. And then the REO business went away on its, you know, on its own um, on its own terms. So, you know, you've had to do this a few times. And one thing that's remarkable with you is like, there's a level of coolness, like that goes along with it, that it's almost for you. It's like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go do this thing now. We'll, you know, we'll rebuild the database. We'll, you know. Yeah, everything's possible. I mean, it really, it, it, they, uh, first off, I, I'm grateful that you said that I had another f- great friend of mine, Beth Woodall used to comment all the time. She goes, you keep evolving. You're, you know, and that's, and that's neat. You kind of have to, you can't just be in one rote way and just continue to do that because the market continues to change. We're changing right now. And, uh, it, it's, it's nice for you to recognize that. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's never going to be, it's never fixed and it's done. It's always a work in progress. And the thing is you got to work, but you also got to play because that, you know, George is a much happier person selling on a boat and, and selling a home down there. And I will tell you, this is hysterical. Jackie's, she's a riot. We're, we're down there and she's, she's writing contracts. She's listing or putting properties uh, under contract and, and going to closings short of physically going to a closing on the back of the catamaran at like nine o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what do you want to do? She goes, let's go for a swim. It's time for a margarita. Yeah. That's a great life. Yeah, that is a great life. And, and if I had to pin down a life that probably agrees with most people, that's, I think, the life that most people, like, th- their inner soul would agree with. Like, this idea that that you are that you want to build a two hundred a transaction a year business, that's not something that ag- that agrees with everyone's soul. Not even most people. A small fraction of the of all real estate agents can handle that and still um, have some s- the modicum of sanity. You know, so kick your ass, you know, so that's what I'm saying. So the life that you have today, I think it's one of those that that really the majority of agents, if you don't have a big why. So if you're an agent and you don't have a big why and you, you know, you don't know where you want to be in the future, you know, and you can't come up with an answer. You know what? Use George's life and put that as your big why until you figure it out, because that's a pretty good one. That's one that. (laughs) <laughs> just no. borrow, say, I want to I work on the back of a boat. Well, it's, it's simple mathematics on this one. So run, run with me on this one. I guarantee you that if you will, if you, if somebody let me coach them how to do a proper open house, you give me 20 weekends a year and five hours prep before that. And I'll give you 20 transactions that are to close. It's almost an assured guarantee. It's a numbers mathematical. You have to do it right. You can't just half ass go, Oh, because open houses aren't that much fun, but they're a hell of a way to build a business. They're a hell of a way to build a business. Don't forget that. You and I probably won't do a lot of them anymore. We don't necessarily need that. That's cool. It's a vehicle. If you give me 100 to 150 people in your database and you do what I ask you to do, which is not sell them, not call them and say, hey, would you refer me? Would you refer me? Get to know them, create a relationship. That's another 10 or 15 transactions right there just with that. Any agent in two years can go from eight transactions up to 30 transactions. They just have to be committed and they have to say, what's my goal? And not forget that. And forget the shiny objects. 
there are no shiny objects. It's everything works. Just do yeah, it. Yeah, and we discussed this briefly before, where it's like the holy grail of real estate is the lead that's really willing and able to either list or buy a house today, and they're yep. just giving you an address. That doesn't exist, so stop chasing it. And when somebody tries to promise you something that even resembles that, they're lying to you. Walk away. It's still, right now, it's still about work. And you just choose what you put that work in. And I agree with you. Listen, I'm not an open house guy. I've never been an open house guy. Right. But I 1,000% believe that if you commit to it and you do them properly, you build a business on it. Because my good friend, Lori Reeder in Fort Lauderdale, yep. does them at a very high level. And she sells a shitload of houses, yep. a shitload of houses from open houses. Because now it became the Lori Reader open house weekend sideshow. So people have nothing better to do sometimes. And they are like, hey, let's go to see Lori's open houses because there's 20 any given day in a very small space. And it's, it becomes, um, it became a thing because they did it consistently. They did it good. They did it with a smile on their face. They believed in it. They bought into it. Um, which is very important. So let me see if I get this right. For Lori, she does open houses in a pretty small, confined geographic area where she works pretty exclusively. And she does a lot of open houses, which means she got a lot of listings from them. And she does it with a lot of energy and a lot of fun. And she's built an entire business on this. 100%. I'm, 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 you know, I'm listen, I'm not... I'm not trying to reduce the accomplishments of Lori to no, open no, no. houses because I'm sure I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand things but that that's I, phenomenal that, that I, she uses that as a, that's one of her arsenals and it's great, right? Because listen, my very best friend, my brother lives down there and he's done multiple transactions with Lori because I referred him to her. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, he tells me he's like, when we list at our house, two neighbors on the street were thinking about listing and they said we have we got a list now we got a list. The Lori Reader team is here. They're doing their open houses. We got to jump in the bandwagon. So I got to ask you a question. When Lori started doing this, did she do this one time and then all of a sudden everybody just fell over with their legs up in the air? Or did she take some years to build this and make it her own? My guess is it took a while. I think like, so too. But I want to I wanna, I, I have her here um, to discuss this amongst many things. But the bottom line is if you commit to it and if you have other people do it, they have to not only commit... People have to be willing to do something because they buy into it. There's got to be a buy into it. Like if I tell, you know, two or three agents, hey, here's my listings. Go do an open house this week. And then they're like, oh, fuck, Mario. Like, we, we don't want to do this. Just go and do them, damn it. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's a waste of time. The, buy, the sellers are going to be pissed off that you're doing a crappy job marketing. Right. But if you walk into an open house and there's two or three agents and it's like, signs hey, everywhere. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, how are you doing? So happy to see you. Like, look at this. You can win this iPad today. You yep. sign up in here, blah, blah, blah. It's a completely different feel. Mm -hmm. And it's just getting people to buy into it. Funny thing is when you do something like that, and again, I, I'm not an advocate of, for me, I, I don't want to do a lot of open houses. I don't mind doing them. I really don't because they're fun and it's a show. But if you're doing something like that, the seller sees it, but the neighbors see it as well. And if you're going to do something right, this I, I'm fanatical about this. If you're going to do something right, continue to make it better than it possibly is. The reason I got successful in REOs is I was never satisfied that we were good enough. It wasn't like, all right, we did it. We're good. Everything was tweaked every day. I've got between Tim and Jen and, and, and Nicole, and just the entire crew. We had 25 people and all of them will say to the last person in the city, which it was never good enough. We kept making it better. Well, and, and that was a, some, something that was, um, that was very, I remember vividly, is the first wave of REOs, it was a disaster. And then oh, it continued yeah. to get better and better, but there were certain agents, and I'm not going to name them, that you knew it was going to be a disaster. The, the proposition was going to be, you know, you basically would have to sit down the buyer and be like, okay, this is what's going to happen. We're going to write an <laughs> offer and no one's going to say anything for a week, anything. And I, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. And then hopefully in about a week, we'll get a counter back. The counter is probably going to be like a hundred dollars off of their list price. And I think you should probably take it at that point. Cause a lot of times that's when they're getting multiple offers, you know, yep. like it was just a disaster or they wouldn't have utilities connected and you had to connect them to do the inspections and all this stuff. Well, when there was a George Philbeck REO, there was a different feeling. There was a different feeling because you knew there was a team that was responsive with things. And there was a team that had a buy into the process. Like if you called most REO teams, you got someone that didn't care that you were calling. You were an inconvenience when you were calling into their office. 
when you called into your office, it was different because you no longer felt like you were an inconvenience to the person answering the phone. That's a big difference. You remember when uh, when Fannie Mae switched over to HomePath and all of Yeah, of course, of that? course. Nobody knew how to use HomePath, including us. So we, we went through this like ongoing tutorial on how to do it. And our whole goal was to help the other agents, the buyer agents that were submitting offers. Our whole philosophy on that was to help them be comfortable enough to do it where they weren't freaked out going, what the heck's happening here? And that took a whole lot of time. But the reason I'm sitting here with you probably has to do with the fact that we were committed to our partners, which is everybody we're working with, buyers and sellers and the agents. Oof, another huge nugget there. If you don't take anything else from this podcast and you're a real estate agent, customer service doesn't mean being good to your buyers and sellers. It means being good to your buyers, sellers, inspectors, appraisers, title companies, insurance companies, surveyors, mortgage people, processors, all of them, all of them. You can't. When I see someone that claims to be a high customer service, white glove, red carpet ser customer service company, and they are um, treating other agents like shit, treating title companies like no shit. No need for that. There's, there's no need for it, and those are your customers too. The other agent, the buyer's agent, that's your customer too. The listing agent, that's your customer too. Treat everybody with respect. There's no need not to. Well, think of it from the, the, the just the basic minimum standard is we're transactional brokers. We have a fiduciary, well, excuse me, not a fiduciary. We have a responsibility to both parties. And that means buyer and seller. It really, I mean, once we're under contract, we're responsible for the well-being of both parties. And of everybody, the transaction, that, really. That's, that's it. Everybody in the transaction, everybody there, which includes, as you said, the ancillary services that we have with the inspectors, the, the home warranty team, everybody else. Why not treat people well? Because if you do, they'll actually treat you fucking well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Unbelievable. Golden rule. Yeah, I, it's... It's probably the most underrated um, thing that I've done in my business over the years because, because I get a lot of phone calls and I've gotten a lot of referrals from a lot of people with those ancillary services, even though in paper they may have a closer relationship to another agent that's not me, mm -hmm. but because they observe the way that I conducted myself in multiple transactions being amicable and friendly and when things get hard i'm the guy that tries to defuse the situation by doing that consistently i've i've gotten business out of it and it's never the it wasn't the intent to get business from it <laughs> wait let me see if i get this right you treated people well you treated them with respect you cared about them and they actually reciprocated what the what heck? a concept right, right? I know, what, what a concept, a concept. What see, a you and I worked together a couple of times and we've had a lot of interactions in here. One of the things that I love most, why it was so easy when you said you want to do this, I'm like, absolutely. is because you're just completely transparent in what you're thinking and you don't get swayed based on your opinion. And I like that. I respect that a lot. And we may not necessarily agree on a lot. We've had a lot in common today because sure. we're really talking about the buying and selling proposition. Uh, but I just, you know, this has just been fun. And when, when, we're, when we're done and we hang up, we'll probably have a beer and then talk a lot more when you guys are going to miss that part. But it's just good conversation. Yeah, listen, and I really appreciate that because I, my thing is I'm a critical thinker to a fault. You know, I have this belief. I have this belief and I've had it my entire life. Uh, but it's it's probably become sharper, you know, the older that I get that I'm willing to listen to anyone. I'm willing to listen to anyone tell, talk to me about anything at all. And if it makes sense, I will change my opinion. Mm -hmm. I will go the other way. But I also understand that when I speak about something, that when I have an opinion on something, I didn't formulate it based on a headline. I didn't formulate it based on what someone told me. I probably did, did research in depth before I opened my mouth about a specific subject. So... Right. Um, I think that's one thing that really misses in real estate is that, that ability to think critically. And I think that's by design because I think if agents were trained to think critically all the time, it would be very hard for a lot of companies to charge someone $30,000 for nothing. Yep. It would be very hard, you know, so, so agents are not only not trained, but it's probably best if they don't think critically to m keep certain people on their pedestals. Okay, so you brought up a point that I, I've, I've, I've had a lot of conversations on, and, it, and I think it's worth bringing up. With everything we do, if you're spending money on Zillow, do you look at the results and what you get back from what you invest? You invest, let's say, $10,000 a year on Zillow. Do you have a set expectation of what's going to be returned to you? Yeah. Okay, and, and so do I. 
if I'm buying a car, I expect a certain thing from a certain level of car. If I'm buying one for $500, I'm not expecting a whole lot from this car. If it breaks down, that's what it is. If I'm spending $100,000 on a car, I'm expecting some really good service from this car and, sure. and so on and so forth. Your brokerage is the same thing as your investment in Zillow, as your investment in Realtor.com, as your investment in, in postcards or marketing. And everybody should be looking at that. There are some brokerages that are out there that are charging 50%. Well, that may be very beneficial if you're getting a lot of training and that's what you're willing to pay for. But at some point in your career is, truthfully, how much training do you really need right now? Yeah, not as much as I probably needed at some point. Well, well, and that. that's, that's okay. <laughs> and, and training's critical. Please don't misunderstand me. Everybody has to learn. Spend the first year working to learn. It's critical. But sure. after that, it's not necessary. And if you wanted more training, where would you go? Probably online. Everything you need is there. So for you, it doesn't make sense to give a broker 50% of everything you do. That's not logical. It's not financially fiscal. Uh, that being said, and everybody's different, so you guys have to do it yourself, but everybody should be looking at what they're paying in everything and then equating, does it make sense? Am I spending too much and not getting a return on my Zillow investments? Uh, fuck yes, you are. Uh, am I spending too little where I could spend more and get more? Are you spending too much on your brokerage? Are you spending too much for your car payments? Look at everything. That's the critical thinking that agents need to do right now. The founder of Toyota said once, the only reason costs are, are, car, are calculated is so that we can reduce them. That's the only reason they would calculate their cost is so that they could figure out how to make them less. And I've lived by that vicariously yep. in business because, because the bottom line is this. Commissions are getting compressed. No question about it. That's, that's yep. irrefutable. The average commission, I track, aver I track average commissions both, both on the buy and the sell side, and I track them to years back on my transactions and then on the MLS as well. I take like a, like a you know, whatever the average transaction is or the medium. Take a snapshot of it. And, yep. and I, I carry it over, and it's gone, you know, 3% per side, 2.8 per side, 2.7, and this year we're at 2.6 per side on average. Yep. And so if the agents are seeing a pay cut, why does it doesn't make sense to me that the brokerages continue to operate on the same antiquated models that they did 10 years ago? Like whatever they were collecting from agents 10 years ago, it's, it's a lot more as a percentage basis of whatever they're bringing in today just as a function of the commission compression. And so if I'm an agent, I'm getting my P&L at the end of the year and I'm going to ask my accountant, what are my top expenses? And one thing that my accountant said to me at one point is, well, this is how much you are paying your brokerage right now, which as a function of percentage of your income, it was somewhere like 14%. He's like, is there a way that we can reduce that? Because you don't have really anything else that we can cut into in here. And I'm like, I'll figure out a way to reduce that. But that's not... You're not going to see a class in a major brokerage about oh gosh, how to no. read your P&L and figure out whether you need to find a brokerage that get, leaves you with a little more cash in your pocket or the, a way to generate revenue additional to what you're currently making. So do you want to, this is, this is what the normal person will go through, meaning me and what happens. So I have four different credit cards that I've had through the REO business and they've been used by different people and, and going so on and so forth. About two years ago, I started looking at that. I said, you know what? I, this is as I was switching over to EXP because I'm looking at everything at this point, saying how can I how can I really bring my costs down because ultimately I run a business and the business has to produce a profit. The profit pays for my family and pays for the boat. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked at everything. I had $890 worth of $9.95 or $9.95 or less reoccurring charges that were showing up on my, on my different four different credit cards. And it took me a year to get them all done because I didn't have the luxury of just canceling a card and making them go away. I had to fight through each one of them. The pain of doing that was at one point greater than the pain of paying $900 or $10,000 a year in crap fees for stuff I was never using. And I would encourage everybody that if you're looking at your business and this, you and I, we, we could do this conversation all day long. If you're looking at your business, don't look at what it costs you this month because this month it's really easy for me to say it's not worth an hour for me to do $800 worth of it is, but you know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. I can put it aside. What's the cost to me long-term? Because long-term is where it comes from. And if, like you said, with your brokerage or with your Zillow expenses and what your returns are on there or your realtor.com, I don't really care what it is, or your 995 credit card bills. Look at that long-term because this is a business and the difference of $10,000 kept is $12,000 earned. You, oh, yeah. You got to figure that into the equation. If you're going to lose $10,000, you've got $12,000 worth of effort coming in. Yeah, I mean, and the other thing that a lot of times people don't figure is 
in the case of what you're describing is how many of those ancillary services that you're purchasing are you, you're purchasing because your brokerage should provide them and they don't. Mm-hmm. And that's another big part of the equation. Or it's a workaround because there isn't something there that it should be in place. Correct. Yep. And and that's a, that's another big one. And the reason I say that is a lot of times people will be like, you know, whenever I, I don't recruit anyone, but whenever people have wanted me to talk to them about their business and I say, okay, let's look at your expenses. And I say, okay, what does it cost to be in your brokerage? And they say, well, you know, whatever is this cap and this is what I pay a month. And then I have a yearly membership or whatever. That's this fee. And I'm like, okay, and that's it. They're like, yeah, that's it. And I'm like, um, no, it's not. do you have, do you pay for an additional CRM? I mean, well, yeah, but that's on the side. And I'm like, well, did your broker, did your broker offer you a CRM? Yeah, but it's not that great. So you're paying for an additional one, even though they told you that they were going to offer you one. So, okay, we got to add that. How about a website? Well, you know, their website wasn't really all that great. So I used this other website, you know, that does, it only cost $19 a month. Right? Right. You got to well, add that to your brokerage cost because th- those are things that you're technically paying for. Yep. Now you're paying for them again because the one that they're giving you is not good enough. Yeah, I agree. And it, everything adds up. Everything adds up. How do you get your business where you, you uh, so this is what I was told a long time ago. It's true. I totally believe it. The most profitable business is a single agent business that sells anywhere from 30 to 40 homes a year without a transaction manager. So you need good platforms to help you in the transaction. You need to get to 30 to 40. Once you go to 45 to 50, you probably bring in on another agent, which means you're going to be splitting half of what you sell because most people are 50, 50 buyer side or even more so. So that agent's going to be supported off what you should probably be keeping. And you're going to hire an administrative staff, which is going to run anywhere from 40 to $50,000 a year because you also pay their benefits, which are not health insurance, but you've got additional taxes and payroll benefits that you're going to have to compensate for. All of a sudden, this profitable business of 300 is netting you 200. And that's before the 995 bullshit fees that are killing you and paying for your extra website and paying for better IDX because you're not satisfied. All of this matters. Work your database, work them hard, be real, focus on that, focus on your bottom line, and real estate can be successful for everybody. Yeah, there is a, there's someone that I, f- I don't want to butcher his title. I think he's a coach with EXP. His name is Hank. Don't know him. I forget his last name, but he does this thing that's he calls it 36 to life, which is build up enough business to do 36 transactions for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. because of the same exact calculation that you're doing. I mean, this is not rocket science. Listen, if you want to build a massive business, you're going to go through growing pains, which means you're going to go from that 300 to that 200 before you go, you know, before you go farther. Hold on, hold on. If you're going to build a massive business, you're going to invest three years to build this massive business, unless you have a CEO and a COO of the business that's going to run it with you and for you. One has got to be a CPA, and the other is probably the best real estate agent in the world. Basically, if you're not the Weimer Group, you're going to have to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild every single three or four years. I can't, I can't encourage anybody to try and build a massive business. I did it. As soon as we got it up and running, the market changes. It's going to change again. Right. Focus on yourself. Don't this... This expansion, I, I love love hearing about this. I was doing an expansion in 2007 before people were talking about it. Okay, it's really cool and it works real well and you got a short life lifespan. And I was one of maybe five people in the country that had the ability to do so because of the gift that was given to me. I worked hard for the REO work, don't misunderstand me. But I was in a unique position. That's not for everybody. Nobody else is in that position. It's not that there isn't that position around anymore. It changes. Don't try, please, please God. Stop trying to grow to the massive teams. There's some people that can do it really well, but the truth of the matter is for most everybody, even the 90% of the agents out there, what work. What do you think it's the, what, there's always a reason and an excuse for most things. What's the real why, what, why people are trying to build this, this big teams? Ego. It's, uh, listen, I, I'm guilty of it. I, I love being the top agent in the world. That was really for a KW, being able to say I sold the most homes. That's really cool. It fed my ego. I'm like, that's great. You know what I am right now? I'm the captain of the fucking boat. You know, I mean, for me, the ego doesn't come into it as much. I mean, I love it. Don't misunderstand me. Everybody, everything we do is ego based. But the reason you want to build this big team is because you want to be the top of something. You know what? Be the top father, but top mother. I promise you, it's a much longer lived career and it's a much better job. I think that's an excellent spot to leave this at. 
Um, this has been a really, really fun conversation, George. We'll do this again for sure. We always do. Um, if someone is curious about EXP and they want to contact you to talk more about it, how can they reach you? 407-925-8433. Uh, 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 my name is George Philbeck and uh, open to conversations on that. And quite honestly, not even about EXP. If you're open to learning how to build your database the right way and how to turn eight transactions into 30 or 40 transactions, realistically 30 transactions a year, 407-925-8433. There's zero cost. I just ask for your real, real considerate input. And if it works for you, spread the news. If it doesn't, don't do it anymore. Thank you, George. Thank you, sir.